Welcome to the Monday, June 7th, 2021 virtual <laughs> session of the Lake Forest City Council. Will the City Clerk, clerk please call the roll? Honorable Mayor Pandeleon? Here. Alderman Morris? Here. Alderman Karras? Here. Alderman Rummel? Here. Alderman Notes? Here. Alderman Preshlag? Here. Alderman Gashkarian? Here. Alderman Bushman? Here. Alderman Weber? Here. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you, Biddy. Uh, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I uh, thank you all. I need to make uh, the following statement in accordance with state statute. I've made a determination that it was not practical or prudent to schedule an in-person city council meeting because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is why this June 21st, 2021 city council meeting will be held remotely. First item on the agenda is reports of city officers, comments by the mayor. Uh, and I'd like to first introduce Todd Nahigian, the Croya manager for the Spirit of Croya Margo Martino essay contest winners. Uh, so Todd, please uh, take it away. Just bringing him in. <clears throat> Hello there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Alderman, for this annual tradition of spotlighting Croya at City Council. This time last year, I acknowledged Croya's 40th anniversary and shared a few things that we were doing to commemorate the great event. Uh, I'd like to share my screen and let me know if you can see. Can you see my Croya Celebrates 40 plus one years slide? Yes. We were finally able to celebrate Croya's 40th plus one anniversary on Sunday, June 6th. We had a wonderful group out at the parking lot with live music and all sorts of fun. It was the actual date that Croya was created by city council. Thank you to Mayor Pandeleon for your recorded message that we played at the event to welcome everyone. We had a great lineup of live rock bands and local food vendors and the weather turned out to be perfect. We're very thankful that the COVID restrictions have been lessened at the time and we've been able to make for a wonderful celebration. These are a couple pictures from the event. On the right is the band Mirror Images with our own Michael Thomas on drums. They played a wonderful set and really were exciting to watch. On the left, you have myself giving a little talk honoring Gene Hotchkiss and Margo Martino, two of the people that we really truly believe our founders of the Croya organization at its core. And then of course, city manager, Jason Wisha, who said a few words and Sally Swarthout, director of forest parks and recreation, who said a few words. It was a wonderful night. We honored Jean and Margot, especially, as well as Frank Farwell in memoriam with the new founders display at Croya. Thank you to the Croya foundation for, for providing this incredible tribute to our three Croya founders that will forever be part of the Croya facility. This is on one of the main walls as you enter the Croya facility and we truly are proud of it and excited about it. And anyone that would like to come see it in person, we welcome you to do so. Croya also officially dedicated the mural at the Illinois Road Viaduct, which was created by local artist and Lake Forest High School alumni member, Tommy Quinn. The mural reads, you belong and represents 40 years of support for the local youth by the city of Lake Forest and the village of Lake Bluff. Thank you to the mayor for being there to help us dedicate it, as well as Jason, the city manager. We had a wonderful group you can see the picture there, Jennifer Karras, Alderman was also there and Sally Swarthout and the rest of the Croya staff. It's really an exciting time for us and something that we've been really proud of in the last months and really been excited to be able to make an official, official dedication. 
Now I'd like to introduce our 2021 Margo Martino Spirit of Croya Essay Contest winners. Each year, these essays are written by the graduating seniors to honor the Spirit of Croya, something that we truly believe has been set in place and continued over 40 years by our one and very own Margo Martino. First up is Anna Seifert. Anna served this year as the Croya Foundation liaison. She will now read her winning essay. People most often think of home as a physical structure that you live in with your biological family. I think most Croya kids, including myself, have a deeper understanding of home. I spent most of my freshman year feeling anxious in my own home. I struggled with my own mental health along with trying to take care of my family members who struggled themselves. I've never felt that I had a place to relax and let go. I never felt that I had a place to truly be myself until Croya came along. I went on my first Croya retreat during the fall of my sophomore year, which was really the beginning of my high school Croya experience. It was nothing like I had ever experienced before. 18 kids breaking down their walls and opening up to those whom they never thought they would. I was lucky enough to be able to attend the spring retreat later that year. My assigned group truly changed my life. My two leaders, Francis Hickey and Lucas Redding, made our group like a family. I shared things on this retreat that not even my closest friends knew. I knew, know this sounds cliche, but for once I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. I had talked to therapists and social workers, but nothing quite matched Croya. To be among my peer and accepted for all that I am and all that I'm not, it's a feeling everyone deserves to feel always. The sense of acceptance pushed me to become involved in Croya activities. For one of my times volunteering at the Croya Poinsettia sale, I was lucky enough to deliver poinsettias to Mrs. Martino herself. When we rang her doorbell with bags upon bags of poinsettias in our hands, she ran to the door with joy. Her face lit up when she saw that Todd had decided to bring youth to deliver that day. We spent 30 or so minutes talking about old Croya stories and how they related to what we were doing. It was truly heartwarming to see how much Croya has not changed. Through its 40 years, the organization is still run by the kids for the kids. I think Mrs. Martino saw this too. She could not stop smiling. As we left that day, she gave me and my friends the biggest hug and, and thanked us for our help with Croya. Nothing felt better. This spring, I had the privilege to attend and lead what was unfortunately my last retreat. After nearly a full year at home due to the pandemic, my fellow leaders and I pondered with our retreatants what makes a house a home. Everyone had their own opinions, but what we all could agree on is that what makes a house a home is not the foundation, insulation, or wood, nor is it, is it the location, the size, or the style. It is the place where you can not only be your best self, but also your full self, where you don't feel pressured to hide any part of you or be something that you aren't. They always say at Croya that everyone has a chapter of their life they don't read aloud. Maybe home is where you can. I was welcomed into Croya as a shy, anxious, unsure of herself freshman and was greeted that day by some, of, by some who have become my best friends now. The people I'm afraid to leave behind, the people who make this place my home. I'm sad to leave Croya and all the people I've met here. Even more though, I am grateful, grateful to be part of a place that is so hard to leave. Grateful to leave these doors as a confident, well-rounded individual. All thanks to Croya. Thanks, Anna. That was wonderful. We appreciate you sharing your essay with the City Council and all of Lake Forest and your dedication to Croya. Our second Margo Martino Spirit of Croya Essay Contest winner is Casey Hippel. Casey served as the Croya Music Chair this year. His band, called Flame, was the headliner for Croya's anniversary festival on June 6th, and they are performing on Wednesday night in the Croya parking lot at this year's Croya Battle of the Bands. Now, Casey will read his essay. More than just a group of letters or an after-school club, 
It's a family, a home away from home, and an essential part of my high school experience over these past four years. It has led me to become the person I am today. The spirit of Croya embraces all people, regardless of their differences. It seeks to build connections and break down barriers that seem to be all over the place in high school. For some people, the spirit comes through in enjoying Croya's many activities and retreats. Others cherish friends they've made along the way. But what has stood out most to me was the Croya battle of the bands and the music scene. During my freshman year, I tried to make friends through school, cross country, ice hockey, and track. Because I'd gone to St. Mary's for middle school, I didn't have many friends going to LFHS, and those that I was close to weren't in my classes. Nonetheless, I was optimistic that I'd find a good base of friends through sports in no time. Cross country went well, and I hung with mainly upperclassmen for a while, and occasionally with other freshmen on recovery days. But in late September, I got a severe stress fracture that fractured again in November and April of the same year. This led to a recovery that took until August of the next year, which meant I had to spend my entire year on crutches. The only outlets I had were exercise and singing weekly with a private teacher. It was a very difficult time for me. In middle school, before all the insecurity was waging, I felt very confident in myself and my abilities as a person, but all that I had had seemed to have shriveled up to nothing by the end of freshman year. I can't remember a week I had plans besides sitting on the sidelines of a cross country or track meet and crutching at a bench at a hockey game. Then, during the next fall, a couple cross country friends of mine, Elijah Feetsum and Trip Pierce, encouraged me to go to Croydon. I begrudgingly went along with them knowing I wouldn't know a soul in my grade, just a smattering of familiar faces that talk around me. But that was not so. As soon as I arrived, there was this sort of lightness in the air and a genuine love of people that resonated with me immediately. I remember Gina Sobe and a few other upperclassmen showing me around and getting me into the weekly activities. It must have seemed so small to them but it felt like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. It completely changed my high school experience. I wanted to have that feeling, the same spirit of Croya, as much as I could. Little by little, I came back and picked up a few friends here and there through all the musicians I'd heard about, or just through seeing someone I talked to in the halls or seen. I went on the fall and spring retreats and started to gain more momentum, friend-wise and with confidence. What really tipped the scale, though, was when I decided to join the 2019 Battle of the Bands after an old friend of mine, Frank Pinn, made the school talent show with me a couple months prior. We had a ragtag crew of four of us, Frank, Jackson, Fiona, and me. After grinding out covers in Jackson's basement for three days straight, we got ourselves a solid 30-minute set list, just in time for the show. A few hours before the show, I broke my leg for the fourth time at a track meet, but luckily I had crutches in the basement, which saved me a trip to the doctor. I was so nervous because I hadn't performed regularly since doing middle school talent show. I didn't even wait for Rick to introduce my band. I just We just started playing right off the bat as I got my army of 10 water bottles behind my left crutch. That night was one of the most memorable high school experiences that I had. In retrospect, we were no masters of our craft at the time and me and my bandmates play the show off our phones for a laugh now and then. But it was all the work that went into the show by Rick Day and all the people who showed up to watch the ingrain watch is what grain ingrained it into my memory. With our faces up on the projector screens and a cool stage set up, we felt like a real band up there. For a moment, it didn't matter how many people I knew at the high school, where my confidence was at for the time being, or what people thought of me. I had this unwavering belief in myself and the people around me that have stayed with me to the present. The spirit of Croya that I felt led me to get more involved by running for music chair with Jekyll Van Way that May. I kept close tabs on the music scene in high school, although I wasn't involved with it yet. I knew that Croy Carpool was about to graduate and Grapefruit had just formed a year prior. It seemed as though we were they were the last of their kind, as I'd heard from Rick and that the Croya Battle of the Bands used to be jam-packed with music acts. I didn't want the creative, light-hearted, do-it-yourself attitude of Croya's music to die off. During my term, I kept my ears peeled for anyone's interest or involvement with music. I'd throw in someone from the school band or orchestra in a song or two in my band sets, or ask students at school rock to cheer us on to the gig. 
This combined with widespread advertisement of new and existing events like the casual autumn jam or the wintertime super jam started a true musical revival in our area. In the talent show we saw the emergence of three musical acts headed by young musicians, including four of which I contacted about getting involved with music at Cornell. Demi Romantic, Verdant, GSA, No You Turn Ahead, two unnamed bands and a smattering of side acts have formed in the past year and a half as the result of our efforts. To conclude my contributions to Croya, I had the privilege to be a leader on my last Croya retreat this spring where I was able to see other high schoolers in a position where I once was and get them to open up. It was one of those retreats that I didn't expect to fall in love with, but it turned out wonderful as we were all so grateful to be there and share in the spirit of Croya to nurse the wound that this pandemic has bore into the lives of, a, of us all. I know that through the guidance of the Croya staff, this very spirit will continue for years to come, and I'd like to thank them for all that they've done for each and every face that walks in the doors. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, for sharing that meaningful tribute. It means a lot to our staff and also to the organization, but also to city council to be able to hear some of the things that you've experienced and appreciated over the years of your high school and middle school days, knowing that Croya has been such a great influence. But what I still say today, as I always have, is that even though Croya has a great influence on the kids, the kids have an incredible, unending, indelible mark on Croya. We couldn't do it without them. It makes us very proud to be part of the organization. And I believe I speak for the staff and the adult board and the Croya Foundation when we say the kids are just outstanding and make us want to be, a, make what make us want to make Croya even more exciting and fun. So I'd like to thank the city council officially for having us here. We're hoping that next June, we'd be able to be in person. That would really be a wonderful thing. We'd be able, be able to enjoy being with you and appreciating the support that we've received. So thanks again, Mr. Mayor and Alderman and everybody at this meeting. Thank you, Todd, and uh, congratulations to the winners. And I'm sure there are a whole bunch of other uh, honorable mentions that we won't get to hear, but I'm sure there were a, a whole, there's a whole book full of fabulous essays there to choose from. Um, you know, Croy is just a unique, powerful, critical institution in Lake Forest and, uh, you know, one of our many treasures. So uh, thanks, Todd. <clears throat> for the great job you do and to the Croya board and all the kids who, as you said, uh, are the ones who really run the place. Mayor, this is the uh, binder filled with essays all the way back to the 80s. Once an essay is written, it's put in this binder and we have it for all the years to come. The ones that we read to you are the ones that the youth committees have voted on and won, but all the rest of them are also in this binder. Can't tell you how happy we are to have this and the opportunity is great. So thank you again. Great, thank you, Todd. And let me apologize for not being in town for the celebration. I, uh, I missed, I really missed going to that. Um, but unless I could be there somewhat virtually, so we did the best we could. Well, you'd be happy to know that the sound company was outstanding and they heard you bright and clear. It was uh, a wonderful thing to start off the event. So thanks Great. again for doing it. Great, okay. Well, thanks everyone. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, comments by the city manager. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of city council. Good evening. Um, at our last meeting, uh, the city council had asked for an update on the status of the Deer Path 41 pump station project and so in that vein, Public Works Director Mike Thomas and Parks and Forestry Superintendent Chuck Myers have prepared a presentation for you tonight to review what work has been done to date and what remains as we look into the future. Uh, in addition, I, I asked them to tee up some, some additional construction activity that is planned for the area beginning next year, just so that it is surfaced with the council and with the public. 
Um, so before I turn it over uh, uh, to Mike Thomas, let me just take a minute to again thank uh, the community for its patience during this project and specifically the immediate neighbors. Uh, there's no question the construction activity has been pretty disruptive at times and so we thank everyone for their understanding. Um, and I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, Public Works, Parks and Forestry and OCM staff, uh, notably Mike Strong over the past four months for their enhanced communications and community engagement efforts as it relates to this project uh, after a bit of a stumble on our end uh, out of the gate. We've really done a fabulous job, I think, keeping the stakeholders informed uh, in advance of new activity occurring. And I think they'll touch on that uh, a bit in the presentation, but just wanted to, to take an opportunity to acknowledge that myself. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to MT. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. I am going to share my screen, if I may, uh, and provide you with the the PowerPoint. Um, you may want to hit your ESC button at the top left to provide you with a full screen of the PowerPoint. Um, but let me begin uh, again by echoing our city manager's comments on a very big thank you for the community. Uh, thank you to the community for their patience. This is going to be a two year project. Um, it's not going to get any better anytime soon, I'm sorry to report. Uh, but in the end, the bottom line I think that we need to all keep focusing on is that we are going to address and eliminate the flooding under uh, 41 at Deer Path. And the state is paying for the entire project and that for someone that grew up here and has worked and everybody uh, knows that is a uh, that is a long-standing issue and problem that we've had in town and it's wonderful that we're able to uh, to get it repaired. Um, so the uh, project team, uh, Chuck Myers, our superintendent, Parks and Forestry, as well as Bernard Pondexter, our engineering assistant, Chuck and Bernard are the two primary uh, guys that are on this job. They're doing a wonderful job. Chuck is overseeing the golf course rehabilitation, working with the, the uh, design engineer as well as the contractor. Uh, he is out there many, many times a day. Bernard is doing the same, but he's working on the construction side of things. Uh, every Thursday morning at 10 a.m., Bernard, Chuck, and I have a meeting with IDOT uh, their phase three engineer, as well as the general contractor. We go over what has been accomplished. We look at a two week look ahead. Uh, and from there, we go ahead and uh, provide that information to Dana and Jim. And Dana and Jim take that information and share it with the community. And they've done, a, as our city manager noted, a, a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, moving on, we, uh, we actually have received a lot of questions, and I'm sure you have, um, by residents saying, what in the world, how is this whole thing working? Uh, I can't tell you how many times in the grocery store I've explained this to people, so I think it would be important for me to take everybody through it. The lines, the different color lines you see here are represent the storm sewers. Not all of them are new, a majority of them are though. Uh, let me begin if I can with the 36 inch going to the 42. That is being worked on now. Um, that actually will be draining West Deer Path, part of King Muir as well. Transitions to a 54 that actually was directional board under Route 41 as well as the railroad tracks and the bike path. And that goes into detention pond number one. Um, the water that actually is under, that, that floods under uh, 41 all the time, actually is going to be uh, picked up by gravity, a new storm sewer that's going to go in starting July 6th. And I'll get, get to that. That actually is gonna flow to the pump station. From there, vertical turbine pumps are gonna essentially pull that water up from about 50 feet below. Uh, and it's going to be placed into a 33 inch storm sewer that already exists that makes its way down deer path that water will go into detention pond two. We also have an additional 33 inch storm sewer that exists that storm sewer is going to go into pond one. So pond one has two sources of water going into it. 
Uh, from there, when it hits the specific elevation by gravity, it drains into this new 42 inch storm sewer uh, that has been installed and is operational. That then goes into detention pond number two. So from there, when the water hits its elevation, it drains out into the 42 inch that exists uh, already and goes into the creek. So essentially what we, what we are doing is number one, draining Deer Path 41 as quickly as we can. Hopefully no more flooding, shouldn't have any more flooding. Number two, we're slowing that water down before it enters the creek. The bottom line, and it's been like this for decades, probably more than decades, all the water east of Waukegan, north of Deer Path flows to the east, period. Uh, whether it's over land, in storm sewer pipes, it all flows to the east and it all ends up in the East Skokie drainage. Uh, we call it the drainage ditch, but the Skokie River. So one way or the other, the water has always ended up there. It's gonna continue to end up there. We're just gonna slow it down and give a chance for that river to uh, empty out, as well as most importantly, drain underneath 41. So the project milestones and what remains, um, as I had noted at the beginning, this is a two year project, two calendar years, this calendar year as well as next. Uh, the project is approximately 50% complete. Burger Construction, the general contractor is really trying to get all of the heavy construction completed this year and next year focus their work inside this pump station building. Um, but in general, both ponds, as we know, have been excavated. The pump station obviously was excavated, shored up. They've been pouring the various floors. Again, it was a 50 foot deep excavation. Uh, the basement floor is at minus 38, so 38 feet down to the basement. Uh, the utility conflicts, AT&T, um, ComEd, Comcast, et cetera, for the most part, those have been relocated, but there's still a few that AT&T and their subcontractor, Archon, is working on, they're working on now. Uh, you'll notice today they were working on installing that storm sewer in front of the Lutheran Church, west of 41. The storm sewer between Awani Road and Pond 2, that was installed, uh, and the lane has been reopened. Uh, the other large storm sewer, uh, and that was a very big part of this project, was bored under Route 41. Actually, they bored a 72-inch uh, diameter hole under 41 in the UP Railroad and then inserted a 54-inch storm sewer there. So what remains? Um, the golf course pond restoration, both ponds, uh, the pump station building, uh, again, their hope is to have it under roof before the snow flies so they can focus on working on it next calendar year. Um, and then, which brings us to the next big topic, the very large storm sewers that are gonna be installed under 41 uh, at Deer Path. That is going to cause uh, a one lane closure from July 6th to August 13th. So I wanted to bring this and remind everybody that this is coming. We're on track for this to occur. You've seen the signs up on Deer Path and on 41. But if I can just go through it briefly, the two exit ramps, uh, the southbound exit ramp, as well as the northbound exit ramp, those are going to be closed. Why? Because there's going to be storm sewer work in this area all the way to this point. And then on the southbound exit ramp, there's going to be some storm sewer work as well. Over here in Deer Path Square, they're going to use uh, this area for staging of materials and equipment. Um, we're going to close Awani Lane at this point simply because we're going to have two stoplights. If someone was to exit Awani Lane, they could very easily run into the opposing traffic. So residents that live on Awani Lane are going to need to make their way over to Awani Road. Uh, we have been working with police and fire on this. We are going to run some tests with the police and fire department uh, here very shortly to make sure that when they come out of public safety, and are heading westbound that the opticons, the mechanisms on the stoplight, turn green and allow traffic to essentially get out of their way so they can make way westbound. So we're gonna be running tests on that shortly. Uh, with that, Chuck Myers, our superintendent of parks and forestry is on and Chuck is gonna talk about the golf course pond restoration and then I'll be back to uh, finish up with a few other items.
Chuck. Uh, good evening. Uh, so as Director Thomas said, uh, uh, my main uh, part in this is the uh, course in restoring that. Uh, unfortunately, IDOT's contractor uh, has not been able to finish the ponds yet. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more shortly, but uh, we we're hoping to be a little farther along at this point, uh, but due to some unforeseen uh, issues, uh, they haven't finished that work. Uh, other things have been done uh, in this project that they're actually ahead of. so. Um, unfortunately with the golf course they're a little bit behind uh, so just to remind you pond one is the west pond that's one that does have golf features in it uh, in the the pond is in the center and on both sides there is a t and a green on two the east pond uh, is just a natural pond it has all native plants uh, that one doesn't have any golf features in it uh, so also to, just to remind you, the, the design work for the golf course portion was done by Lohman Quitno, Quitno Golf Design uh, and V3 Engineering. It was their uh, natural areas management division that put together the plant list uh, that, that I think some of you have seen. Uh, so um, basically uh, the, the way the ponds were designed was a bit tricky, uh, challenging because Obviously, the water levels fluctuate. Uh, we do think that the uh, water level will be fairly consistent most of the year, but it did have to be designed with the fluctuation in water level uh, uh, in, in mind. So basically, the planting near the pond edge is submergent type plants, things that uh, are in water all the time. Uh, so if you look on that photo or the uh, the aerial, I think it just popped up again, uh, you can see some of those areas that jet out that are in green. Those are areas that are actually underwater all the time. Those, if you look at the photo on the far right on the bottom, you can see those same areas popping out into the actual pond. That is pond uh, two. Uh, and those are basically safety uh, shelves so that if somebody does get down in there, they're not very deep. They're typically only about a foot of water, uh, but they will hold plant material. So um, as you go up the slope, plants have been selected uh, that can survive uh, with an inundation of water. So as you go up, there are rushes and stages and things like that. And at the very top, the orange color uh, is basically a short grass prairie. So it's all native, it's all uh, sedges, rushes, things like that, that should look very nice uh, from Deer Path Road uh, and to the golfers, of course. Uh, so with that, we also hired uh, Craig Bergman Landscape Design to look at the Deer Path streetscape. So all along this corridor, we wanna make sure that uh, we're restoring that the best we can. So the number one concern, uh, especially on Pond 2, with its close proximity to the sidewalk, is that uh, of safety. So we are basically looking at designing that with layers, layers of either a rail or fencing uh, and plant material, so shrubs and trees. So we would layer that to offer as much protection as we can. We don't want someone to go down into that area. Uh, it's not that steep, but being right next to the uh, sidewalk, we wanna make sure if somebody did veer off with a biker or whatever walking, they wouldn't get hurt. Um, but of course, this is a major corridor going into the city. So um, we are looking at aesthetics as well. So we're working with uh, Craig and his staff on this. The design has not been uh, completed yet. Uh, but it's well on its way and it'll be reviewed by uh, aesthetic beautification and we don't expect to actually plant much of that until the fall. Obviously now it's, we'd rather not be planting trees and shrub this time, shrub, uh, shrubs this time of year. Uh, so more to come on that. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, IDOT has not turned over both ponds to us yet. Uh, pond Two, obviously we've done most of the work on it already. We, I shouldn't say most, but a, a lot of the seating has been done. 
Uh, we haven't done any planting of uh, the native plugs yet, but uh, that pond has been given over to the city for full restoration. Pond one, we have not received from IDOT yet. Uh, we hope to be getting that in the next few days, hopefully. Uh, it is our concern that we get going on that. We want to restore the golf course to full, uh, all 18 holes fully playable. So uh, with that, there's a lot of sod that needs to be put in. So it's gonna take some time to get that going. Once we have both ponds signed over to us, like I said, hopefully even this week, then the city can invoice IDOT for 80% of the agreed upon amount for the project. So 80% of 693,000. Once we finish all the restoration, then we can invoice for the remaining 20%. Uh, so there, obviously with a project of this scope, it, it, it does have some impact on golf course users. Uh, Kemper has done a really nice job of keeping golfers informed. I talk to them quite a bit and let them know where we're at and they have passed that on to members and players. Uh, they have reported some uh, people that have called interested in playing and they wanna know about uh, the, the course and construction and some people opt to play elsewhere. Uh, we're having a pretty good year. We do think there has been some modest impacts Obviously people don't necessarily wanna play with all the construction. There's been some inconveniences in getting into the course, uh, but also we've shortened two of our holes. So um, all in all, like I said, probably a modest impact at this point. Uh, hopefully we can get this back uh, to the golfers uh, fairly soon though, later this year. So with that, I'll hand it back to uh, Director Thomas. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, again, um, as I had noted early on, um, but wait, there's more. And there's two items, ComEd bridge replacement as well as a water main replacement that will uh, go on next, next calendar year. And I wanted to introduce this to the city council and the residents at home and take you through sort of the background uh, as to why this is happening now. Um, to begin with, with the ComEdge pedestrian bridge, that is the very first bridge as you're heading westbound on Deer Path, you pass the golf course entrance. The very first bridge you go under, ComEd actually owns that bridge. Lake County has its bike path on it, but ComEd owns the bridge. Um, ComEd came to us in August, September of last year and said, uh, they have always had a difficulty accessing their high power lines along Route 41, and they need to access uh, their equipment via the bike path, but their challenge is getting over deer path. Uh, and I, they told us they had a number, one, number of these situations throughout the county where they actually own the bridge. So the bridge currently is rated for 20,000 pounds. They need a, for a rating of at least 80,000 to get their larger equipment on. They own the bridge, they're gonna go ahead and replace it completely. Uh, and they're paying for the, the total cost of replacement. Uh, we have met with ComEd multiple times, Kathy Cerniak, uh, Dan Strand, Chuck, myself, others staff to review their proposed plans. V3, the engineering and construction firm is their engineer. Uh, and they're beginning to uh, I don't want to say finalize, but they're getting very close to being able to finalize their plans. Uh, the work is anticipated to start next April. They actually wanted to do the work this summer. And with everything going on with the contractor, we told them they, they, they could not. Uh, but the challenge is going to be this. It is a, right now they're telling us, a four-month construction, April, May, June, July. There are twice, two times, that they need to close deer path 100%, not down to one lane, both lanes. Uh, two weeks at the beginning to take the bridge deck down, uh, two weeks at the end to put the new bridge deck up. They also, uh, and obviously for safety reasons, they said, we've, we've got we've to close it. Uh, there's too much that's going to be uh, happening in that area. Um, obviously, as plans are finalized, we will work with public safety. That's going to have an impact on them as well. Um, but the one thing ComEd did note to us, and I spoke with their 
representative last week as he said you know four months is a conservative estimate he said depending upon what the city will allow the contractor to do meaning could they work 12 hour days could they work saturdays um they could speed things up and essentially said you know the, the, the more the more flexibility you give us and the more you stay out of our way the faster we can get this done so again we're not anywhere near close to having any of that uh, nailed down but we're beginning to talk about the actual logistics behind what this actually uh, what this actually means for the community how quickly they can get this project done the second item uh, is a water main replacement and upgrade from Awani Lane to Gulf Lane, the area that is highlighted in the two red circles. We, uh, we completed our water main replacement study at the distribution study last calendar year, presented that to the finance committee. Uh, and this is a water main that was identified. Um, the state actually, uh, part of their project is to resurface deer path from the creek all the way west to approximately Westmoreland, a little bit east of Westmoreland. We, I went, we went back to them and said, look, if ComEd is going to tear down this bridge, uh, we also have a water main that we want to install, which means people living on deer path will, re will receive new water services. Please do not resurface deer path. Uh, hold off until those two items are completed because they really are going to beat the heck out of deer path. So the design is underway. City Council had approved that. Um, and we are hoping by the end of September to have design drawings and a cost estimate. Uh, currently, the funding is shown in FY23 out of the water fund. We may come to the Public Works and subsequently the City Council uh, to request construction actually begin earlier. Again, one of the things that we are focused on is fast forward to mid-August next year. By mid-August, uh, school starts typically the third week, we need to have deer path resurfaced and striped, and we need the contractors out of there. In order to do that, we've got to get ComEd done and out, and we need to get this water main in and out. Uh, so the finished project is a nice new uh, deer path road uh, with new landscaping and we move on from there. With that, uh, myself and Chuck are happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a comment and, 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 and question. First of all, what a huge project. There are so many interwoven parts to this, uh, Mike. Uh, kudos to you and your staff. You must just be working on this 24 seven to get it accomplished for the residents of Lake Forest. It's a very important project and just thank you so much for bringing this forward and getting this accomplished. It's been needed for so long. Um, my question though is an aesthetic one. I mean, thank you for the presentation, Chuck, on the ponds. Are we, have we seen a design of what these bridges will look like when they're completed. You know, currently um, those bridges are aesthetically pleasing and have a certain design to them that sort of um, uh, represents a certain style. So I would hope that we'll have some input into what the final look will be of those bridges. It's such an important entryway to Lake Forest. I would hate to see something that doesn't complement its surroundings uh, constructed there. And uh, so can you comment on that at all? Will we have some input? Uh, we, we uh, as, as staff have been uh, working with ComEd and reviewing their drawings, we've had Kathy Cerniak included in that uh, Alderman Rummel to really address that aesthetic side of things. Um, one of the things we're trying to work with is to make sure the bridge doesn't stand out, that it that it sort of flows with the entire area and really is not something that people, that really catches their eye. Um, we obviously plow that bike path in the wintertime, so we've got to make sure that snow isn't going to be falling on either side. From a safety standpoint, there's a railing. 
So what we're trying to copy is something similar to the bridge that's uh, the railing system that is next to public safety, the, the, uh, the bridge that goes over the creek. We're trying to copy something similar to that, um, but there are precast panels that ComEd is proposing to use. Uh, it is not an arched bridge. Um, and again, we're trying to work with them to um, meet in the middle, recognizing completely it's theirs and they're paying for it. And they've got a timeline that they need to work on. They've been very cooperative. They've been very understanding. We've gone back to them two or three times and asked for modifications and they've accommodated. Um, so we're continuing that process. We're actually uh, talking tomorrow at staff level and we're gonna have another response to ComEd this week. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we are. Well, thank you. I, I do think that we'll hear about it if it's not something that is pleasing and that it, that blends well with its surroundings and represents our community to some extent. I do think it's important. So thank you for keeping on top of it. You're welcome. Other questions or comments for Mike? I, I have a question. Gareth? Thank you. The, uh, the road closure uh, or the I guess the lane closure July 6th through August 13th. Is that does that also mean that those ramps are going to be closed during that time? Yes, the two the two exit ramps, as well as bringing deer path down to one lane. Uh, all of that will occur from July 6th to August 13th. So people will be able to get on heading south or heading north, they just are not going to be able to get off at deer path. Uh, and again, because there's going to be large storm sewer work on those exit ramps close to deer path and then deer path as well. Uh, they'll have some very large pipes going in. So, yes. Okay. So I'm sorry, you, someone could actually, you can't exit there, but you could actually go North or you could Correct. go south, right? Correct. Um, and then Correct. the, um, the, the detour will people, I guess in terms of the communication will, will, will people, either get off either north or south of there, right? And we'll communicate that to residents. Correct. Or... Um, when they were, uh, and, and really it was a good trial run for us, when they were uh, pushing that 72 inch core pipe under 41 in the UP railroad, they closed down the southbound exit ramp. Uh, and there was a good amount of signage up on 41 that essentially had people heading down to route 60, uh, west on 60, back north on 43. And this will have the same, the same, uh, same result. Um, going northbound, uh, they're they're going to need to get off, and same thing, 60 to Waukegan. So there is signage up now, and uh, yes, we will be and have been communicating that. Yeah, I, I just know that we've included uh, messaging on it in the last three. Uh, weekly e-news blasts out to the public. So we'll continue to do that and probably, um, you know, uh, continue to uh, use other communications tools to maybe push notifications as we get closer. But we'll we'll do all we can to get the, the word out to the public. Thanks. Um, Michael Thomas, Eileen Weber here. I just want to quickly follow up in, in light of what's coming with the lane closure. Do, have you had any headway with IDOT to adjust the timing at 41 and Old Elm and Wesley to accommodate the heavier traffic that we'll be seeing moving east and west? Uh, yes and no. 41 and Old Elm, uh, I checked that actually over the weekend, and those timings, the east, the east westbound timings, have absolutely increased. Um, Wesley, I need to follow up. Our street supervisor needs to follow up to confirm if that has occurred yet or not. Uh, okay. But I know what Old Elm it has. Um, Wesley, we will we will check with them this week. Right, that's Wesley's usually my run. I haven't noticed a change yet, but <laughs> thank you for your yep. diligence on that. Yep. Anything else? Okay, Jason. If not, uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, and if there are no other questions, that would conclude my report for this evening. Thank you. Okay. It's going to be an interesting two, two summers, it sounds, or a summer and spring. So. 
as always, the communication aspect is going to be a crucial piece. People just can't be surprised. So uh, next item on the agenda is opportunity for citizens to address the city council on non-agenda items. Uh, members of the public can provide public comment by calling 847-810-3643 or by utilizing the raise hand function on the Zoom screen. We'll uh, wait a minute or two to see if anybody's calling in or raising their hand. Mr. Mayor, we, oh, we did have a raised hand. Okay. No longer raised. Okay, no callers. Mr. Mayor, we have a caller on the line. Okay. I'm gonna bring her into the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for holding, you're with the city council. Please state your name. Hi, good evening. My name is Katie Anderson. I'm a resident of Lake Forest, and I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Lake Forest Lake Block area. As an educational and advocacy organization with 100 years of experience, the League has supported clean air and water, recycling, and environmental stewardship since 1970. The League supports measures that reduce pollution in order to protect surface water, groundwater, and drinking water. Furthermore, the League has studied the impact of coal tar sealants and advocates tonight for initiatives favoring the ban of coal tar sealants in our community. The City of Lake Forest has directed considerable effort and investment focused on stormwater management and stable, healthy ecosystems in our ravines, the north branch of the Chicago River, and Lake Michigan. What must follow is the reduction of the polluting effects of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. In doing so, Lake Forest will join its neighbors, Island Park, Deerfield, Winnetka, Wilmette, Evanston, Park Barrington, North Barrington, and South Barrington in taking concerted action to combat water pollution. Later tonight, you will hear an update from the ESC. The League has attended the ESC since its inception, and we have advocated a ban on coal tar sealants to that committee. We thank you for the opportunity to speak and to consider our vision for a more sustainable lake forest. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. This is uh, something that's been talked about at the council for a while and uh, obviously, obviously will uh, be dealt with here in the near future. Uh, are there any other callers or raised hands? I guess not, since we've taken down the screen. Mr. Mayor, there are no other callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Nor are there any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is committee reports. We have a report from the Finance Committee uh, on consideration of the annual appropriation ordinance for fiscal year 2022 and approval of rollovers. This will be the first reading and will uh, be presented by Elizabeth Hollow. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Action requested of the City Council this evening is to grant first reading to the fiscal year 22 appropriation ordinance and the approval of rollovers. Um, as for way of background for those in the public who may be watching, um, the City Council adopts an annual budget for the city. However, the legal mechanism for authorizing the expenditure of public funds comes through the appropriation ordinance. And statutorily, the city is required to approve and file with the county clerk an appropriation ordinance by the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year. So for us, that's July 31st. So this evening, you're considering first reading of the ordinance and on July 19th, um, we'll conduct a public hearing and ask the council to grant final approval to the appropriation ordinance. There are some differences between the appropriation ordinance and the budget. So included in your packet is a crosswalk that takes you from the annual budget that you approved in April to the totals that you see in the appropriation ordinance presented in your packet. 
Some of those differences include um, the reduction or elimination of debt service funds. So although we include those in our annual budget, the authorization of semi-annual principal and interest debt service payments are authorized as part of the bond ordinance that the city council approves when the bond is issued. Also, um, the library fund is not included in the city's annual budget, but is included in the appropriation ordinance. So we add the library expenditures. Also, um, because of the city charter, the school district 67 appropriations are included not at this time for first reading, but will be included in the version that you see on July 19th. So those are added. Um, another significant difference is rollovers. So the city has used rollovers um, quite effectively for a number of years. Those are items that were budgeted in the previous fiscal year, but either weren't started or were not completed during the fiscal year. And so departments have submitted requests to roll the, that those budgeted funds over into fiscal year 22. And so we do that via the appropriation ordinance. We've included in your packet um, the current list of rollover requests. Um, and you can see those itemized by fund, by account, and then by purpose. Um, but I would just note that um, at this stage, we're still paying invoices um, back to fiscal year 21. And so you'll probably see a number of adjustments in this list when this comes back for final approval in July. But you can at least see the preliminary list of requests made by the operating departments. So those get added into the appropriation ordinance as well. And then the final adjustment for appropriation ordinance is the contingency of 10% added by fund in addition to that adjusted budgeted total. What that does is allows the city council to approve expenditures that were unbudgeted and unanticipated throughout the year without having to hold a public hearing and adjust the appropriation ordinance at that time. It's important to note that staff are administering the budget based on the budgeted numbers without the 10% contingency that is simply provided as a mechanism for the council to approve unanticipated expenses throughout the year. So with that, I will um, pause and address any questions that you may have. Questions for Elizabeth. I would just compliment you, Elizabeth, as usual, for an excellent job. That's a lot of detail and a lot of work. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, if there are no questions, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve, approve first reading the fiscal year 2022 appropriation ordinance. Uh, Second. Okay, uh, roll call vote, please. Alderman Morris. Aye. Alderman Karras. Aye. Alderman Rummel. Aye. Alderman Notes. Aye. Alderman Preschlag. Aye. Alderman Gashkarian. Aye. Alderman Bushman. Aye. Alderman Weber. Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and uh, everybody should uh, be aware that a public hearing will be conducted on July 19th, 2021, in conjunction with the second reading of this uh, ordinance. Uh, next committee report is from the Environmental Sustainability Committee. Uh, Alderman Rummel, uh, who's the chairman of that committee, has a few updates for us. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'd like to update you on a matter that's before you tonight in the omnibus um, uh, section. As you may recall, the City Council approved an amendment back in February to the city's governance plan that oversees our aggregation program. The amendment, which we looked at, allows the city to explore and participate in new models of municipal aggregation programs that may offer community benefits beyond supply rate savings for residents and small business customers. In particular, city staff have been exploring a model that would guarantee residents and small businesses pay the same rate as the ComEd default rate while providing the city new revenues to use toward environmental sustainability projects such as purchasing renewable energy credits, electric vehicle charging stations, installing solar panels on facilities or other programmatic and capital infrastructure investments. 
the committee met earlier this month and is recommending approval of a three-year supply agreement with MC Squared Energy Services for this program. Under the terms of this proposal, the city would receive $90,000 a year in an annual grant to put towards some of these environmental sustainability projects. So over the three years of the contract, we would be seeing an income of $270,000. If approved, the program would launch sometime in the late third quarter of this year, so that's September or October. Again, it's on the omnibus agenda and seeking your approval tonight. Um, I have a couple of initiatives. So are, are there any questions about the, uh, this agreement, this solar supply agreement? Seeing none, I will move on to the second portion of, uh, of my presentation, which is an update on the survey on environmental sustainability. At our meeting in June, the committee reviewed the results from the sustainability survey that was distributed to members of the city council and the city staff. And I'm going to take this opportunity to share some brief highlights of that discussion. First of all, I want to thank you all for taking the time to complete the survey and share your thoughts and insights. The topic of sustainability is very broad and can be somewhat overwhelming to tackle. And so it's important to us as a committee to have this opportunity to get the pulse of where we have alignment and shared understanding and interests with our fellow council colleagues. On that note, we found that the city council as a whole shares a lot of interest and support for the initiatives that were outlined in the survey. Interestingly, there was no one who was strongly opposed to any of the 33 initiatives that were on the survey. Sometimes there were one or two opposed, but generally people opted for strongly support, support or neutral. So what are some of the initial takeaways after reviewing the survey? Well, as one might expect, stormwater management rose to the top in terms of areas of concern. And there was support for focusing on individual initiatives and not specific categories. And also, there was a great preference of leaning toward incentives and engagement versus standards or requirements or bans. There was also strong internal alignment between the city uh, council and the city staff. So at our last meeting as the city, as the committee discussed these themes and reviewed the results of the survey, we talked about how we'd like to focus our attention. Because of the broad level of support, it was the committee's perspective that we have an opportunity to focus on some things that are important and have a high level of support. And at the same time, we could go down into the mid-level of support and focus on a couple of projects that may stretch us, but that may also have a deep impact. So the four initiatives that the committee believes will offer us a good starting point in which we believe balance these interests include number one, and a lot of these initiatives just rose right to the top of the survey. And it had to do with developing a communication strategy and campaign that advocates for sustainability and environmental issues. While we know we're in the midst of an ongoing recycling education campaign, we also believe we have a role and an opportunity to broaden our messaging on other important topics, such as ravine management and maintenance, single use plastics, um, uh, um, discouraging the use of, of uh, gas powered landscape equipment, um, promoting solar energy, promoting bike routes, promoting permeable pavement, rain gardens, bioswales, et cetera. There also was great support for a bike festival to highlight bike routes and the general beauty of Lake Forest. So that, that um, communications 
item was item number one. Item number two was exploring the installation of solar panels on city facilities. The point was made during the meeting that the city should be leading by example, and this was a good place to start setting the tone. The third initiative was to encourage periodic inspection of ravine property to detect ecological or infrastructure threats. This was an area that was deemed important for both the city council and the city staff. So we're going to explore how we might support and assist residents in maintaining their ravine properties. And the fourth measure, which we felt was very important and that the committee and the council and the mayor, uh, when he first created the committee talked about, and that's measuring the city's greenhouse gas emissions. The committee re recognizes that there is a need for a better understanding of our baseline data to help inform our decisions going forward. And so that at some point we can measure the impact of some of these initiatives. While uh, we recognize that we can't do all 33 of the initiatives that were on the survey, uh, we believe that this is a good starting point for us and it touches on a few areas of interest by many of you. There were 16 initiatives that really fell in the middle range that we feel has the support of the council. Some of these are already underway, um, such things as renewable energy credits we've already started on, converting our city fleet to, uh, to electric or hybrid vehicles, converting some of our mode areas to green space. So we're already moving forward on some of those. And the committee will be looking at some of these other areas as well. But we wanted a starting point, something that was doable, something that's not overwhelming for a very busy city staff. So um, this is where we thought we would start. And uh, so I want to thank you again for participating in the survey. And I want to also thank my fellow committee members who brought a lot of energy and enthusiasm to our last meeting. And I think we're all anxious to start to move forward with the city staff on some of these initiatives. So, um, so it was a great, uh, it was a great start and, and we look forward to it. Are there any questions from the council on any of, of what I just spoke about? Hi, um, Alderman Romo, this is Jim Preschlag. I, I thank you for that report, that was great. Um, and thanks for your leadership on the committee. I just wanted to give a real strong thank you to Mike Strong and all the city staff that um, work behind the scenes to formulate the survey and, and really get the committee off the ground. Um, they did a great job, uh, both Chuck Meyer and, um, and Jim Lockerfeer and, and, and Michael Strong in particular to engage an outside consultant as well. Uh, and Mike's done a ton of work just putting together the process that we're going through to get our arms around all of this. And he's, he's really done a, a fantastic job. So I just wanted to give him a shout out uh, and thanks again. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that Alderman Weber and I um, agree with your kudos to the staff who really have put their heart and soul into this um, and it's a challenge it's a new committee um, and so we're feeling our way but i feel confident that with the members of the committee that we have we will be moving forward so um, thank you again and thank you to all of the staff who participated in putting this survey together um, i know i reached out to kathy cerniak uh, as did as did mike strong we, we reached out to Mike Thomas and got their input. So it was a pretty thorough um, survey. And as you noted, there was also sort of an element of education about around some of these issues. And Mike Stockton made sure that it wasn't too technical, there wasn't a lot of technical jargon. So it was um, user friendly. So again, thank you again for all of your assistance. Um, any questions or comments further? Thank you and thank you all for your support with this initiative. And uh, now on to the Deer Path Golf Course and related issues. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of meeting with 
Vin Suarez about placing bamboo straws at the golf course. I was doing this on behalf of Green Minds that has a bamboo straw initiative. Well, in the process of meeting with Vince, he showed me that Kemper Sports has taken on various environmental initiatives, both at the corporate and the local level. Our own Deer Path Golf Course and our concessions at the beach have adopted many environmentally sustainable practices that I think you all will appreciate. So I asked Vince, who was our regional operations executive for Kemper, to walk through a few of these in particular, and I thanked him for his leadership in promoting and demonstrating Kemper's commitment to environmental sustainability. I think you all will be interested in his presentation. So take it away, Vince. Well, thank you, Alderman Rummel, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and the rest of City Council. You certainly have heard me talk before about some of our corporate initiatives like True Service, True Review, Safety National. Green to a T and our environmental sustainability program is something that I'm thrilled to be standing here in front of you, sitting here in front of you tonight to be able to discuss. We're gonna just go through quickly our environmental program. We'll talk about what we've done at Deer Path Golf Course and the Lake Forest Beach as far as environmental sustainability and then what's up next uh, on the horizon. <clears throat> our Kemper Sports uh, Green to a T program is our environmental sustainability program, which emphasizes and focuses on maintenance practices, uh, water conservation, recycling, and energy use. Our Green to a T program has four levels of participation uh, at Kemper Sports, level one, two, three, and four. Uh, proud to announce that Deer Path Golf Course is currently through level two in our Green to a T program, working our way towards level four. <clears throat> I wanted to quickly introduce the team to you who, who handles uh, the boots on the ground. Uh, looking forward to uh, introducing you to these folks in person uh, when council uh, gets back into in-person meetings. We're led, we're led at the property by our general manager, Patrick O'Donohue. Uh, Nick Yakeley is our superintendent. Uh, we have, of course, Chef Z, most of you know Chef Z, and Greg Baton, our head golf professional. So these are the four people that really live, breathe, and, and, and execute uh, Green to a T uh, at the property level. So our Green to a T program uh, it focuses, again, on purchasing of, of supplies, equipment, recycling, an integrated pest management program, water conservation, the reduction of mowing and community outreach. And I just included a little picture of uh, one of our NOMO areas at the property. We've got several NOMO areas at the property, which certainly reduces uh, our water, reduces our manpower, reduces our need for fertilizers and chemicals in those areas as well. So current practices that we have at the golf course, we use slow release organic fertilizers uh, in most of our applications. We use wetting agents that we apply on the golf course. What a wetting agent will do is reduce the need for water consumption. We have a commitment to hand watering. We roll our greens three to four times a week, which create, helps to create a healthy root structure and makes the greens more deep disease tolerant. It also reduces our need for chemicals and fertilizers on the putting surfaces. We recycle our solvent solutions through a third party. These are the solvent solutions that we use on an everyday basis down at the maintenance facilities to wash our parts and, and our equipment. We have our integrated pest management program, which IDs certain pests, uh, talks about the life cycles of the pests, control methods of the pests, and really sets our thresholds for what we're looking for uh, and what we, what we will accept as far as pests are at the golf course. We run soil tests and soil samples on a yearly basis at the golf course, so we know what we're dealing with and we know how to react. We have uh, started we have started to change over our LED conversion in the clubhouse. Happy to report we're about 90% converted in the clubhouse, and this is going to reduce our need for uh, energy. Additional current practices that we have at the golf course: uh, Energy Star four uh, Energy Star 4.0 products refrigerators, microwaves, uh, all of our, most of our equipment is energy four-star uh, product. 
We use green seal mark of environmental responsibility for our cleaning supplies. We use a green seal uh, for our towels and toilet paper in all of our bathrooms, including the comfort station. We reduce our need for paper usage and email. We use, we use email, we use Teams, we use, we use uh, a variety of different methods to reduce that paper usage and avoid printing things out on a daily basis. Our shopping bags are all made out of recycled plastic, both in the, at the pro shop and at the sand wedge grill. Our current practices, and this has been going on for some time now, so it was, it was great when uh, Alderman Rummels and I sat down, I was able to, to share with her some of the things that we do on the restaurant side and have been doing for years. We eliminated the usage of all of our styrofoam cups back in 2018. We have a small chef's garden and very small uh, with pe peppers, cilantro, and uh, uh, hot peppers as well. We recycle our aluminum cans. We use corn-based straws in the sand wedge grill along with have, access, have used and continue to use on occasion paper straws. We use compostable containers for all of our to-go items. We use corn-based silverware and corn-based plastic cups and lids for our banquets and everyday usage on the golf course. And I just included a, a little picture there that shows the compostable uh, container that we have and the corn-based cups and lids that are in use. Moving forward, as we, as we make our way towards uh, what we call green to a T level three in our, in our corporate initiative, we'll increase our use of organic fertilizers. We will certainly uh, look for additional garden opportunities that we can uh, start growing some more of our vegetables and some more of our crops that we use on a daily basis. We have a goal to become Autobahn certified. And we of course wanna increase our community outreach. And just wanna open it up for questions that anybody has on our in environmental sustainability at the facility or our green to a T that we promote through our company. Are there any questions from any of the council members for Mr. Juarez? Seeing none, I want to thank you for both your environmental initiatives and uh, thank your corporate uh, operations for their attention to these matters. It does make a huge difference. And thank you tonight for your presentation. Uh, and that concludes my report of the Environmental Sustainability Committee for this evening. Thank you. It's great to see this committee starting to really find its feet. So uh, it's it's only been a few months actually, and that's the thing it's easy to forget. Um, so uh, let's uh, keep up the good work. It's, it's, I think the survey was very well done and I think it probably helped everybody uh, to kind of focus attention on, you know, the priorities as opposed to the sort of endless list of things it could be. So. Uh, kudos on that. Uh, the, next, Thank you. Right, the next item on the agenda is items for omnibus vote consideration. Uh, I have a relatively short list of six tonight, some of which we've already touched on. Uh, first is approving the extension of the mayor's declaration of a local state of emergency until the next city council meeting. Second is approval of the June 7th, 2021 city council meeting minutes. Third is consideration of an ordinance amending the City of Lake Forest City Code regarding alcohol and beverages. First reading and if appropriate, final approval. Fourth is consideration of an ordinance amending the fee schedule to reflect those changes in the liquor code. First reading and if appropriate, uh, final approval. Fifth is approval of the purchase of dual band capable portable radios for the fire department from state bid vendor Motorola Solutions. And sixth is an authorization uh, for the mayor and city clerk to enter into a power supply agreement in substantially the form presented with MC Squared Energy Services, LLC. Are there any items that uh, any member of the council would like removed or taken separately? Alderman Bushman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd request that uh, item three and it's related item four 
uh, be taken separately. I have some questions uh, I'd like to ask and concern that, and also suggestion in terms of how we proceed with the uh, uh, revision of the liquor code. Okay, does this, uh, I, I need a little uh, procedural assistance here. Does this remove, did we still, do we remove them from the omnibus completely? Yes, we would remove them from the omnibus agenda and approve the omnibus without those two items and discuss them after that vote. Okay. Uh, in that case, I would uh, entertain any other questions or comments on the other items that Alderman Bushman did not want removed. Okay, I guess we'll have a roll call vote on those, please. Or I have a motion to approve and then a roll call vote, please. So moved. Second. 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 Alderman Morris? Aye. Alderman Karras? Aye. Alderman Rummel? Aye. Alderman Notes? Aye. Alderman Freshline? Aye. Alderman Gashkarian? Aye. Alderman Bushman? Aye. Alderman Weber? Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay, motion carries. Okay. Uh, thank you all for that. And now, uh, uh, Alderman Bushman, please uh, let us know what you're thinking. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, let me ask some questions and I'd like to focus in on uh, the insurance provisions, uh, which are section 111.045 on page 47 of our material, or page 25 of the uh, uh, liquor code. Um, currently, we provide a requirement that the uh, uh, liquor vendor uh, have $2 million uh, of comprehensive general liability coverage. Uh, and we're proposing a change there. Uh, one reason for a change is that uh, when you have these sort of provisions, it is advisable to distinguish between whether it's on a per occurrence basis or on an aggregate basis. And uh, that, that change is proposed. But in doing the change, we're actually reducing the amount of coverage we're asking the uh, licensees to have uh, from a $2 million coverage uh, in comprehensive liability to a $1 million figure. And recognizing the type of business this is and uh, uh, you know, in issues of litigation, uh, I'm wondering whether we should have, instead of uh, what's being proposed, uh, have the percurrence uh, left at 2 million and the aggregate level increased to something like 4 million. Uh, and there may be reasons even to go higher than that when you're dealing with uh, uh, liquor sales and service. But uh, that would be my, uh, my thought in terms of uh, the insurance provisions. Um, so I would ask, uh, Kurt, Kurt asked for work on this. Uh, Kurt, obviously you have a lot of familiarity um, with, with what is fairly common in the industry, both in the municipal world, maybe on the commercial side. Any uh, any uh, clarity you can provide on why this was recommended? Certainly. Um, so the 1 million per occurrence and 2 million per aggregate is one of the more standard insurance requirements for liquor licensees. Um, so that's just more common. Um, and that is generally what a lot of uh, liquor license holders will have before they come in and apply. So. It was really just trying to match what uh, most applicants come in with. There are some, uh, uh, the real concern you want to have with comes to the liquor license is that they have the mandatory dram shop insurance. So that's the real coverage here. Um, this liquor, this is just general liability to ensure that if there is a larger instance of uh, a claim that's unrelated to actual no fault dram shop issues that they're still going to have insurance there. There's not really a concern for the city's perspective from liability here. Um, that's really where that no fault uh, dram insurance thing comes in, but we can certainly increase that. Um, it's not all that common in the uh, municipal liquor licensing realm, but there's certainly no prohibition on us increasing those if we want to ensure that any license holder has higher limits um, than you know is required in other instances. So maybe you could just e explain for the council if if we require a higher limit than what they would otherwise carry uh, operating somewhere else, what does that practically mean for a business in terms of Certainly. difficulty coming here? 
they would they would just have to go to their insurance carrier and increase their limit so they it's, it's an added cost for that uh liquor license holder that's the real world impact for a, a liquor license applicant and, and what's the magnitude of that added cost have you any idea you know i couldn't tell you off the top of my head alderman rumble hmm. i could get my husband and ask him <laughs> <laughs> And it maybe varies too with the type of person who's uh, requesting a liquor license is that uh, you'd certainly expect a uh, retail establishment uh, that's part of a food store or some other area that sells liquor to have uh, general liability coverage uh, much greater than those numbers, mm -hmm. tenfold, twentyfold, uh, besides that umbrella that goes on top of that. Uh, but it, uh, you know, in terms of when we have contractors and whatnot, uh, uh, to have $1 million uh, limit uh, for the general liability uh, in this day and age seems uh, to me on the low side. But maybe, and, and, and let me raise another question, uh, the surety bond, uh, that's another change you're looking. Uh, we currently require a $2,000 surety bond or what I call a performance bond. Uh, and uh, we've had a little discussion on this uh, and uh, the question of uh, you know, whether the $2,000 is meaningful uh, and whether we need a surety bond. Uh, but I'd like you to you know, comment a little further for the benefit of the council. And on that point, uh, if you're looking for a comfort level that the uh, licensee will perform, uh, will pay penalties, will pay the response costs, uh, will pay their taxes, is a surety bond something that we should consider? Certainly. So uh, the surety bond currently is $2,000 and it's required of each license holder. And in the event that their license is revoked, that bond is forfeited. Um, that's a little bit of an, uh, these bonds uh, that are required in the event of revocation are a little outdated. They're not very common in other liquor codes nowadays uh, because the local liquor commissioner can impose other fines and can suspend licenses and has other enforcement mechanisms to try and make sure that each license holder is complying with our code. Um, from a perspective of whether or not it's really necessary or do we want to require it to ensure that we're going to recoup any potential costs, I don't know. Again, that $2,000 is pretty small, so it's not really a deterrent for any current liquor license holder or any potential license holder to comply with our code. I think the fines and the potential loss of their license is the real um, hook or enforcement mechanism we have to ensure they're going to comply. And again, it's not really securing any direct costs that the city has sunk into that license or ensuring that that license holder is going to comply. So um, it's again, it's an added cost to each applicant. It wasn't really something that um, as far as I'm concerned, from as far as I'm aware, I don't think the city has ever had to call a surety bond uh, due to a revocation. So it was a little bit outdated and it just wasn't really serving a purpose right now, given that we do have other enforcement mechanisms to ensure that each license holder is compliant with our code. Although in the enforcement mechanisms, uh, we talk about penalties and I think we even in the uh, code uh, have uh, response costs that mm -hmm. uh, we look to recuperate. Uh, would a surety bond help to assure that we receive those uh, reimbursements? Potentially. Um, I think we could look at amending that language to try and increase if we wanted to increase that surety bond amount um, again 2000 is a fairly minimal amount so if we were looking to increase that to a higher amount to try and ensure we we're going to recoup those costs uh, we could um, I don't think there's any prohibition in the Liquor Control Act that would prevent us from doing so. Mm -hmm. Hi can I interrupt okay. for a second here hold on um, I'd like to hear something from the staff on this there's a reason why this was done in the first place and nobody's been allowed to address that and we're talking about deep technical details of the liquor code uh, that were changed for practical reasons, I believe. So maybe we can hear something from the staff on why we're, why we're proposing this instead of assuming that we're- And I'll ask, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll ask uh, our city clerk for the board to comment on that, but I'll just say at a very high level and she can provide more specificity than me. Really the purpose and intent behind this, as I said earlier, was just to bring our code in conformance with what industry standards are nowadays. But Pity, anything you want to specifically add? Um, that That is exactly what I would love to add. Um, the Municipal Clerks of Lake County actually uh, last year put out a survey 
to um, all the clerks in the organization to find out what their fees were, what they were charging, um, if they had surety bonds. We had uh, a number of training sessions on uh, liquor license, and so Blink was one of our presenters there. Um, we all we all had the opportunity to take a look at what we were doing and and kind of bring into um, perspective what is more common. And um, it is common to have the one million um, per occurrence with the two million aggregate and. Um, the surety bond in our circumstances, um, there's not, there's maybe a, a small handful of very small communities who have that surety bond in place, but some of the larger communities don't carry that surety bond anymore. I'd also like to bring a little perspective as a commercial landlord uh, in my private life. Um, those limits are very common for retail establishments, both TJ Maxx and the local uh, you know, dry cleaner. So 2 million is about the highest you'll see because it, it does cost money and then managing it and administering it is a pretty staff intensive effort. Same thing with the surety bonds. Can I ask a question? Uh, it's Alderman Weber. Um, Ms. Boyer, can you comment if we've had to collect on any of these surety bonds in the last 10 or 15 years? I, I can't find any history where we've called a bond. Um, we've not revoked a, a liquor license to call that bond. What all the municipal clerks did agree on is the state requirement for the dram shop insurance, which um, attorney Athens was referring to. The state sets that limit. Um, we don't set it. That's done by the state and all of us follow that. If I can just add one more thing, um, that's a suggestion that uh, you know we've we've uh, had the uh, uh, document uh, submitted to us for this meeting, a 30-page plus document, uh, and I'm wondering if uh, it'd be appropriate, uh, recognizing that this is something that's uh, taken uh, several months by staff and uh, the city attorney to put together, that we uh, provide an opportunity for the public. Uh, to review the proposal, uh, particularly considering that we're looking for a complete update of our city liquor code. And uh, it would go to the point that uh, at this meeting, uh, we would simply be acting on first reading and not waiving the first re reading, but giving the public an opportunity to digest this, including the licensees, uh, the liquor people or the people who are interested in liquor license to give them an opportunity to provide comment so that if, as we do a complete revision, uh, we assure ourselves that we've had uh, the opportunity for the public to uh, add its input uh, and maybe you know make any further revisions that we would de deem appropriate. Uh, this is uh, Alderman Preschlack. I just, um, I feel like I trust the staff on this. It, to the mayor's point, it's. You know, it's fairly technical. Uh, we have a great city attorney uh, and a firm that, that helps us and have a lot of confidence uh, in Biddy and, and Jason Wisha to guide us here. And um, I think uh, I'm very comfortable with just approving it as written and I read the whole thing. And I, I, I don't think that it's gonna change much if we delay it. And, you know, we gotta get good at making decisions, I think. That's part of our job as aldermen is ask questions before the meetings and come up and it's okay to disagree, but uh, we just have to make a decision and, and move forward, I think. Other comments or questions? Well, have there yeah. been any questions from the public or from licensees on this? I can answer the question um, to licensees in regards to the surety bond. Um, that's a, that's a, a cost um, that they've asked for the past nine years that the city consider um, dropping the requirement for that surety bond. Um, and that's from most of our licensees. Oh, really? So okay. there has been a, a request from several to drop the surety bond requirement. It, it is a bit outdated. Um, most communities don't carry that requirement. Hmm. And what would, so would there, uh, you know, perhaps um, 
we approve this tonight and eliminate the surety bond requirement if that seems to be something that uh, licensees you think that's a big ask for some of them to come up with that surety bond miss boyer you're muted it it is um it is an ask for them but i think if the you know if the insurance levels are are benchmarked to other communities and um as the mayor said are pretty standard in the commercial space and the whole goal is to you know try to make this compatible with adjacent communities and get to market i don't know why we'd be resistant to to just get to market and trust the process that the staff went through i guess we must think that we're smarter than them or i don't i'm not quite sure what the motivation is but uh, i think if you if you have a conference and you you know you you kind of benchmark communities and peers and the surveys sent out and we have an attorney that goes through it and a city manager that's comfortable with it and it's proposed to us in an omnibus um, I, i'm very comfortable with supporting all the revisions as written and appreciate the staff doing all the hard work and um, and for your leadership on just streamlining this and just making it more compatible to market conditions. I really appreciate the work. I concur. That's scary. That, that caught my eye though was the fact that our current uh, requirements has a $2 million coverage. And that would be to me applicable both to the aggregate and the per occurrence. And we're cutting it down to one minute uh, for the per occurrence and uh, i thought that was rather strange to do but it, it, going to the other point uh you know i don't demean anything that the effort has gone into this and i appreciate the fact that we've looked at others and how they handle it uh, but there are still certain judgments that need to be done and uh, i still would suggest that uh, we give the public an opportunity to uh, provide input uh, including uh, you know uh, posted on the website that we're considering changes to the entire liquor code and solicit public comment. Uh, I think that's uh, something that uh, in terms of uh, the opportunity to have public input is uh, to me very helpful. Okay, I guess what I would suggest is uh, we, uh, I, I uh, entertain a motion for first reading So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, and uh, roll call vote, please. Can I ask for clarity for issues? Is that first reading on um, item number three or item number four? Is it for the amending the liquor code or is it for the fees? I guess we have to vote on them separately. So item three, first reading, and then we'll take item four on the same basis. Very good. Alderman Morris? Aye. Alderman Karras? Aye. Alderman Rummel? Aye. Alderman Noakes? Aye. Alderman Preschlack? Aye. Alderman Gashgarian? Aye. Alderman Bushman? Aye. Alderman Weber? Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, item four, please. I have a motion. What's the motion? Motion to take uh, first reading on item four. So moved. Second. Alderman Morris. Aye. Alderman Karras. Aye. Alderman Rummel. Aye. Alderman Noakes. Aye. Alderman Preschlack. Aye. Alderman Gashgarian. Aye. Alderman Bushman. Aye. Alderman Weber. Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. I, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Alderman Bushman for bringing some of these matters to our attention and having a discussion on these items. Uh, you know, especially, I mean, the surety bond issue, there seems to be some division and some dissension among the licensees about it. So um, thank you for reading this back carefully and bringing some of these items up for discussion. Thank you very yeah. much. I think you're muted, Mr. Mayor. All right, yeah. Uh, next item on the agenda is additional items for discussion and comments by council members. Any general comments or things that uh, any member of the council would like to bring up at this point?
Okay, uh, given that I don't hear any, there is, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Did I hear somebody opposed? No, okay. Okay, thank you all. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Aye.